Hello, and today I am joined by Professor at University of Kent, John Dickinson. John, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem. I appreciate you giving your, your time up. What, what have you been up to today? Um, well, it's been a bit of a mix of uh, teaching practical classes uh, with, with our sports science students. I've been running a few uh, conversations with athletes around sort of the breathing problems that I help them overcome. And, um, and actually did, uh, sort of having some conversations about doing outreach with schools. So a bit of everything really today. So I've been a bit mixed. Right. So is there a lot of engagement with, with, with schools then with, with your work? Yeah, I mean, one of the aspects of working at the University of Kent, um, obviously, we want to try and communicate what we find in our research to you know people that maybe wouldn't come in touch with it but also to inspire kids that maybe are interested in doing sport so uh, I'd, I'd spend quite a bit of my time actually sort of talking to kids uh, students doing things like GCSEs or A levels or BTECs and you know obviously a lot of them who do sport are quite keen to be a sports person but obviously we can't all be a professional elite athlete and so one of the maybe um, other options is for them to actually be involved in elite sport but maybe be a practitioner so that could be doing something that I do be a nutritionist be a biomechanist so we we kind of talk to to students about what we do at university what sort of research we do how that maybe helps um, athletes overcome various problems and then hopefully inspires them to maybe think about having a career and that might be that may be doing a sports science degree or a sports therapy degree or something similar that's really good because again I did sports science and that you don't really know what you're going into I like sport and I wanted to go to university so it was like one of those things really it wasn't probably wasn't much thought other than that but it, and not that I regret it in any way but it'd be good to have a bit more context of what you could go into and different applications of things yeah well that's I mean that's that's pretty much why well, you know when, when I'm sure we'll get into it in a bit but that's what pretty much why I chose to do a sports science degree good at Good at a look, good at various number of sports, but never, never, never elite at any. And then quite like science, and it was kind of like, well, let's go and do a sports science degree, and we'll worry about we'll worry about what we do later, sort of thing. And that's kind of where you know where where sort of like you know it's where it all started, really. Yeah. Oh no. Well, that that'd be interesting. So going back to that then. So where were you from originally? Um. Well, originally uh, born in Chester, grew up in uh, Ellesmere Port, sort of at the bottom of the Wirral. Um, so I went to school um, at a place called Stanley High, uh, which I don't think exists anymore. But um, I went to went to went to uh, that school uh, and then sort of did my GCSEs at A levels there, um, and then uh, went over to university in Bangor in North Wales. So and ever since then I've sort of moved around the country quite a bit. And then so so what was that prompt? Did you touch on it briefly there about liking sport, wanting to get into science? But how early on did you realise that this well? I guess thinking of doing what you're doing now is quite a you're a real expert in your field so like what what was the vision at that point if there was one um at the point of going to university it was more i don't want to go to university i want to do sports science and at the time i probably was still i was still trying to try to do the best i could do at the sports i was doing so i was just maybe maybe focused on trying to learn a little bit little things i could take into my own sport really and then um i never really thought about doing a phd whilst i was doing my undergraduate i just I just sort of fully engaged in what, what you know the classes that I was doing so you know it was just trying to do the best I could do in the classes and especially the ones that you know you start you start to get a feel for what subjects start to interest you more and probably more the physiological ones were more interesting to me than the psychological ones and so I started to to do things around that 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 area but I you know I I I do a lot of work with kind of breathing problems in athletes but certainly when I was doing my undergraduate degree that was not part of my kind of like thought process of going, you know, I'm doing this to be able to be able to become an expert in breathing problems and athletes. That was you now breathing problems and athletes weren't understood when I was at university. So it wasn't certainly wasn't kind of on, on the top of my radar to get into. Mm. And then so how academic were you then when you were at school and in well, pre May levels? Um, I, I probably did all right in the exam. So, I mean, sort of I was I was never a straight A student, but I was, you know, pretty, did perform pretty well. I've got. From my my son's going through his GCSEs now, so I was, I was trying to encourage, trying to trying to say you got to beat your dad, but um I was sort of doing a couple of bit like sort of B B A sort of bits, a bit of a mix of B and A's in a GCSE, and then I think I got a A A B at uh, A level, so I was, you know sort of decent. I was never sort of like top 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 of the class, but you now somewhere somewhere that was a competent student, and I probably you know I wouldn't say I sort of spent every hour living out of the day. I mean I probably made sure that I was playing sport more than I was doing my homework. Um, but you know, but I think having that healthy mix between, you know, do, doing 
doing some doing some sport breaks up your revision time and that sort of stuff. So I think it's you know. Um, I think that's what I try and get my kids to do. You know, make sure you, you, know, you spend all day behind the desk. It's probably not the best thing in the world for you. Mm. And like, what were the sports that you played? Um, I did a bit of did a bit of everything. So sort of basketball, football, tennis were kind of my main three. I played played golf as well. Um, and that's what I do more now of because I've got a bit older, can't move as well. <laughs> so it's the golf course for me. Who do you support out of interest football wise? Uh, uh, Liverpool's my team. Um, yeah, well, so, I thought it might have been. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on Klopp? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, he's been brilliant for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've got a season ticket there, so I still go try and go quite a lot to the games. But, um, uh, yeah, but I think he's been been a revelation for us, really. And if, you know, I think he's, he's, he's last few years he sort of mentioned he's, he's you know at some point he's going not going to be here. Obviously, whenever it's going to come, it's it's a bit like an Alex Ferguson moment, isn't it? You kind of go, you know, or when you know, Bill Shankly kind of left. Liverpool's like, oh, what do we do now, sort of thing. But um, you know, hopefully that everything's in place for the next person to come in, and uh, you know, sort of pick 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 it up where he's left off, and, and and hopefully there's not too much of a dip. But I think you know, if we don't have a dip, it'd be some, you know, it'd be quite amazing, really. So whoever whoever comes in, um, has got a bit of a challenge on their hands. But I think the squad's in a decent place. It's not like when Ferguson left United, where the sort of squads got to, you know, almost like fin, you know. It's sort of the end of the squad's kind of uh, generation, whereas like, I think the the squad we've got at the minute is quite young and up and coming, if you like. So it should be quite exciting for whoever comes in, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm an Everton fan, and even oh, okay. even me, like I, I wouldn't have 20, 30 years ago, I would have obviously would have would have been delighted. But even as a, a neutral, if you can call myself a neutral, like he was so such an impressive guy, isn't he? Like he just is. You would love to have him as your manager for any team. Oh yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's, he, I think he, like even your manager, even your manager at work, because I think like, what he does is he doesn't, he's not a, he's not a sort of dictator. He's very much a sort of a growth. You can see kind of he helps people grow, and it's more about the person rather than the actual task that they're doing, sort of thing. And and I think when you actually kind of whatever you're doing, if you've got that kind of mindset about making, you know, kind of making sure whatever the person's doing is right for them, and working on that kind of growth of the person, you're going to probably get the best performances out of people. Whereas if you just worry about you know, why didn't you sprint for that ball? Then you're probably gonna, um, you know, probably gonna be sort of make, you know, making, making problems for yourself that aren't there. So I think he's a very good sort of man to man or person to person sort of um, sort of manager that you know. Everyone, I would, I'd imagine, ninety nine percent of people love. I'm sure there's some people, some people that don't get on with him, but not most people do. Yeah, no, no, I think it's a really interesting point talking about like the person first and foremost. And like, for, so in terms of like your work, it's very academic. But then, how does that translate into your world? Um, well, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I've, I've probably spanned quite a bit, quite a bit across various things. Because I mean, as a researcher, you're you're taught to be pretty neutral, pretty clinical. You know, you you're trying to get people into do your research projects. You look at the data, you analyze the data, and then you come up with your conclusions. But then at the other end of the spectrum, I'm I'm also an applied practitioner, so I will go and work with athletes. And, you know, a lot of the time I go and, you know, I might go and screen a, a football team, for example, and we do some tests for asthma, for example. And we know athletes are more likely to have asthma or asthma like asthma like conditions than the general population. So when we've been into football teams in the past, we've had about one in four players. It was a uh, have an asthmatic issue. And some of those players might not realise they have it. So you've got to, you know, say if you're a footballer coming for a test, and I've just rocked up on that day. They come and do the test. They give us a positive test, which actually suggests they've got asthma and haven't realised it. You've got to be quite careful the way you deliver that because, you know, these football players are quite good at what they do. Some of them are international, some of them won World Cups. And if you're turning around to them and going, oh, by the way, you've got a breathing problem, they're going to look at you a little bit, a little bit kind of, kind of odd. And so the way you kind of, kind of be able to kind of generate that kind of one-to-one -one relationship is really, really key because... Not just with the player, but also with the the the, the medical team around that, because they've got to then support that player. And so to kind of get a good relationship between yourself, the medical team that you're working with, and the players, really important because they've got to trust you, and you've got to uh, obviously trust them in 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 in, in, what, in what you're doing. So um, yeah, I think it's, it is key. I think over the years I've probably learned learned that sort of thing. You know, I didn't have those sort of skills automatically. I mean, when I first started doing testing with elite athlete, I was pretty much well, test says you've got asthma. You're going to need an inhaler. 
deal with it <laughs> so, 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 sort of thing. And, and you know then over time you're going to realize maybe that isn't maybe the best way of delivering that information because obviously you've got all the other stuff that you don't realize the athletes kind of carrying all that baggage and then you start to understand kind of actually maybe there's better ways to deliver that kind of information over time mm. and do you get any support in terms of training for that um i haven't personally and i think maybe that is an area that you know i think it's really difficult to teach and I think sometimes you, you've got to accept some of those skills are just you, you sort of learn out by just exposure to those environments. And, and I think I think sometimes we can be quite harsh on new, new people who come into the environment new and they maybe struggle a little bit initially to kind of try and make those links because, um, you know, for one reason or other, the environment might not be the right for them or they might, you know, they might be a bit too, too front, you know, too, too forward with what their opinions are. Um, and so I think you kind of learn to, to you know, just being in that environment, you learn over time. But sometimes, you know, if you're working in an elite environment, maybe there isn't the time to to give people that, that those experiences. But I think to, the more you make people aware of what that type of environment is like, how to behave initially, is it is is, is it gives them a start. But I don't think you can, I think, you, you know, you can get trained to a point in those one to one relationships. But ultimately, I think the, the only way you can develop your skills in it is by actually going out there and chat you know delivering something um and develop and then developing ways to create relationships so i think it's i think it's quite difficult to teach it yeah can be a little bit forced sometimes if you're trying to follow a script or ask an open question or whatever it is mm-hmm. so yeah no no i agree so when you were at university then what, what was the was there any particular plan when you were at bangor and planning what you were going to do for your career like midway through your degree um, again, not not necessarily. I mean, I, I say I've got quite involved with the football team there. Started doing some coaching, and, and I guess probably when I was at, when I was at the university, maybe I thought coaching might be where I go down. Sort of, you know, I was quite a keen football player, coaching coaching the first team as well. I was doing sort of summer camps, going over to America to coach football over there. So I was thinking that you know, this is quite 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 enjoyable. Um, so that's probably what my main my, my initial main thought was. I'll, I'll go down the coaching the coaching road, and then I think probably when I started doing my dissertation in the third year, that started to get me switched on a little bit more to research and kind of you know in, in, interest in research and kind of where research can take you and how research you you know you can as much as sometimes elite sport is kind of ahead of the research, and then we need the research to prove what the elite sport are doing is is maybe the right thing to improve performance. Um, but it, it got me interested in that area, and that's probably when I when I left Bangor, I was probably actually more thinking about, well, maybe I'll go, maybe I'll look at kind of a, a research career. Obviously, when I left, there was you, know, you got options there. You can either, you know, this is sort of like early two thousands, so two thousand and two is when I graduated, and it was, you know, you could could stay on to do a master's there, could go and do a master's somewhere else, um, but I probably didn't have the money to sort of fund myself through a master's so I started looking almost I, I managed to get a first class degree at, at Bangor um, and so I, I, I was um, I was thinking well maybe if I can get a funded PhD position I can just sort of go straight into that and so I started and back then like now at the moment PhDs are advertised online like job like jobs back then PhDs weren't so you basically had to find people in universities email them with your CV say I'm thinking of this area is my CV have you got any PhD opportunities and so it's very much kind of like being proactive um and initially I actually went up to Edinburgh um Harriet Watt and I got an interview up there and got offered an opportunity to do a PhD up in Harriet Watt but the PhD was on sort of um sub-maximal testing to predict uh, maximal exercise in elderly people and I was like it's great I've been offered a PhD but just I thought I've got to do three years of this and I just couldn't see myself doing three years of kind of looking at submaximal testing in elderly people so I said sort of said thanks and no thanks and at the time I didn't have any other plan and then but through my coaching I was receiving FA magazines um and I got a um a, there's, an, there's an article in there about power breathe and how football teams are using power breathe and power breathe is like an inspiration muscle trainer makes you basically develops your um sort of respiratory muscles um and there was the they were talking to the lady that was part of the the, the, the basically was part of the basically part of the, the team that invented it and so i emailed alison mcconnell who was working at brunel and said really interesting article in the fa magazine um it look, uh, really interesting concept around looking at breathing respiratory muscles and football performance 
Um, and then she sort of said, you know, I'm interested in doing a PhD. Have you got anything that you just sort of started or got anything opportunity? And she actually emailed me back within a week and said, oh, we've got this opportunity to work at the British Olympic Medical Centre um, looking at asthma in, in the Olympic team. Do you want to come for an interview? <laughs> so so um, next week I went along for an interview um, and yeah, and then got offered the opportunity to to basically the remit of that of that PhD was basically to test athletes for asthma in the build up to the Athens Olympic Games. So without and again, this is kind of like whether I go, is it luck? Is it just right place, right time? Is it because I was proactive? Whatever it is. Within six months of under, uh, finishing my undergraduate degree, I was testing Paula Ratcliffe and and um, Matt Pinson for breathing problems. And you're like, what, you know, <laughs> what, what's going on here, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, but but it, so it's quite a bit of a quite a bit of a springboard from going undergraduate, finish, and then you know, messing about for for six months trying to find something to do. And then um, yeah, in January two thousand and three, I started started my PhD um at the british olympic uh, medical center sort of it was sort of via brunel but i was sort of working at the the british olympic medical center um which is quite you know quite quite interesting and and um yeah and at, at the time i was um i was the only person in the country really testing athletes for asthma problems so having not paid too much attention to my spirometry classes at, at, at bangor in it we might have done one practical on it i suddenly had to become an expert in testing lung function via spirometry and then sort of teach myself how to do the tests we need to do to met, to basically try and trigger off asthma in, in elite athletes which was great because you know you teach, teach yourself and then obviously within six months I'm the only person in the country doing the testing so all these athletes are sort of coming to me for tests uh, and, and I'm working with the, sort of the, the best sports medics in the country kind of helping athletes get them get the right get the right sort of thing for their for their asthma but um yeah so it's a bit of a bit of a sort of a you know jump into the fire and see if you can survive sort of thing yeah well, why do you think you got the the, the posting then I, I you have to you have to talk to greg <laughs> who employed me for that, Is that one. greg retta yeah greg white uh, professor greg, greg white. white was uh, my, my, my supervisor at the, the, and he was the head of the uh, head of science at the british olympic uh medical center at the time um I don't know. I honestly, I could, I couldn't tell you. They probably, they might, maybe they've took pity on me and went, well, we got, we got, we got, to, we got to get, a, you know, got to get our northerners in here somewhere. <laughs> got to get a better geographical spread of people working at this place. Uh, I don't know, but I, I but I, I mean, I think, I think I was quite passionate. So when I went to the interview, obviously, I'd been proactive in emails. Um, I'd, I'd read the, I read an article that was in, of interest to me. I'd emailed the person that I was in that, um, that was in, involved in that article and sort of. Put, demonstrate that I was keen in the area that she was she was working in when I went along to the interview I actually took my dissertation thesis with me and said and just to sort of demonstrate my um you know so look this this is my kind of level of research now and sort of showed showed them that I had the research skills to talk with deliver sort of uh, research so they could sort of see that um yeah and then and obviously then I can't remember I can't I can't remember any of the questions that they asked me but but then obviously answered them okay, uh, and then say a couple of weeks later I got a call said, you know, if you want it, you're in, sort of thing. So um, yeah, and then off, then off we went. Yeah. So what was that like then? You going in with like the biggest stars prior to the Olympics? Cool. Um, I, 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 generally speaking, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty calm. I, at any time, I've got really nervous when they've actually gone and tested the whole of the Liverpool team. So, so that's the only time I've been a bit starstruck. But like you know, when you know, I was testing like your, your Matt Pinsons and 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 James Cracknells and those sort of people, uh, and obviously they're they're big names. And obviously you don't you know you want to do a good job. But I, I guess you know you just kind of take it in your stride and and you know. And I think I was fortunate at the time because obviously you got I wasn't just there by myself. So what in the in the early stages I would have one of the other physiologists with me, kind of just you know. I might be doing my lung function bit whilst they were setting up for a, for a VO2 max test with the athlete, and so we sort of do do the testing as part of one big one big testing sort of event for the athlete. And I think it was good having those experienced people around me because you know they they were pretty calm and chilled out because oh Matt's coming in or oh, oh, he'll 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 come in on his bike and the coach will the coach won't be happy because he's ridden his motorbike into the centre of London and you might you might fall off it and that sort of stuff. So you just sort of, you know, it just relaxes the mood a little bit and then and then you just get on with what, what you want to do. So 
Um, yeah, so I think that was that that was quite quite helpful. And I say I think the confident, you know, I think everyone was pretty laid back as well. There wasn't, you know, people weren't looking at them sure to say saying you, you can't say that to that person, or you can't say this to this person. They were very much as long as you're doing the job, it was pretty much just 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 be you sort of thing. And I think that that helped quite a lot in the early stages. So who else was part of that medical team then that you you were working with? Um, so in in so we had so Greg was sort of in sort of the lead of the science part of it, and then we had uh, Steve Ingham um, was there and Charlie Pedler. Um, we had Richard Godfrey, um, uh, Kate, and Dave Makutovich. Uh, so it's got sort of that, that's the sort of the team that was sort of there as kind of the the, um, the physiologists. Um, well, the, the kind of the sports science team, like when Rob Shave was there as well, actually. Um, was, and then there was a bunch, bunch of physios, and then we had sort of med, 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 medical team kind of came in. So we had Richard Budget was there, it's probably the, um, and he's now, well, he, he he will be up until Paris. The, he's the, basically the, the lead doctor, the head of the IOC, <laughs> as, far, as far as medical go. So some of the people you work with, you could sort of scratch your head going, oh. He used to go on Christmas nights out with Richard, and now he's like in charge of the medical committee at the the the, the IOC sort of thing. So, yeah, you know, meeting people like that just yeah, unbelievable. And then say so Greg, Greg was sort of my main, and having him as a as a mentor was was unbelievable because you know again he was so so just you know letting me kind of yeah, let me kind of do my own thing, let me kind of grow, you know, sort of point me in the right sort of direction. But you know what was very, wasn't particularly we didn't really dictate what we were doing sort of you know did trust me a lot um let me kind of you know dictate sort of where the research kind of went and things um but sort of then would just steer it a little bit um to kind of kind of get the best out of it so um yeah so I think the team there were fantastic really and I think you know I was really fortunate the actual team were such a great team that you can kind of like grow 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 and build you know you kind of it's a bit of a shame when when it all when we, we all kind of sort of start to go our different ways a little bit but um that's what that's what happens Mm, yeah, and how long were you there for? So, I was working at the, the British Olympic Association uh, and with the, with the British with the the it started off as the British Olympic Medical Centre, then it evolved into the Olympic Medical Institute, and then I actually t- stepped over and about half through my PhD went and worked for the English Institute of Sport. So I spent about a year and a half at the Olympic Med well Olympic Medical Institute by the time I'd left. And then I stepped over to work at the English Institute of Sport, pretty much doing the same thing. But the English Institute of Sport had different satellite centres. So it was easier to kind of get into the athletes around around the, around the England rather than them all having to come down to um, come down to London for the testing. So then I moved. So I moved my hub moved from being in uh, Harrow over to um, where were we? Um, we were in uh, Bisham. So I was sort of working at Bisham Abbey. Um, but then going to the the satellite centres in Manchester, in Loughborough, in Bath, um, to test the athletes around around the country, and I sort of worked there until uh, 2007. So I sort of I'd finished my PhD when I was at the AS, and then and then worked there for about another year um, after that. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, worked with pretty much worked across all the Olympic sports, both winter and summer sports. Um, pretty much, you know, pretty much every, everyone really, um, which was you know. When you look back at it, you go, oh, like, you know, sort of, you oh, you see someone on TV, oh, I tested them, you know, and kind of, <laughs> it's quite, quite interesting. And so was it just timing that you managed to do your PhD when all of this sort of technology was kicking off? Well, what 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 happened was, so what what triggered my PhD to be available was the uh, the IOC and WADA at the time basically came and like, basically joined their anti-doping policies together. And basically what happened when they did that they they changed they basically changed the rules a little bit as to base um what athletes what what evidence athlete athletes needed to be able to use asthma therapy in the olympic games so what they what basically what it meant was that every athlete that was using a subusable inhaler so the blue inhalers had to demonstrate they had asthma before they could use it so what it meant was there was a ton of work that needs to be done in the UK that somebody needs to basically go around and test all the athletes for asthma. And that was essentially the, the, the so they funded a position to be able to do that. And the way Greg funded it was they basically got some funding to do it as a research project rather than simply as a, a deliverer, if, if, if you like. Um, and that's what basically triggered off, tr- triggered it off. So initially, and so we did have problems. So one of the things, one of the, 
things that we found was we found the British Olympic team, the prevalence of asthma at, at the 2004 Olympic Games was 21 percent. So 21 percent of the team had it, um, had asthma. The general population's prevalence is 10 percent. So if you're an Olympic athlete, you're twice as likely to to um, to need an, an asthma inhaler than um, if you're not an elite athlete. But what we also found was about 20 percent of the team that were using an inhaler we had to take off because they couldn't give us evidence of of needing asthma of 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 a of a positive test so they've been misdiagnosed um and a lot of the time they've been misdiagnosed because they've gone to the doctor and complained of breathlessness during during sport but um and so the doctor had simply gone well it sounds like asthma having an inhaler um which was kind of what was happening at, at the time but what we found was a lot of these times when athletes just report symptoms it's not asthma that causes those symptoms and so that's sort of spurring the, you know a lot more investigation into go well, hang on a minute are we starting to are we missing athletes because the other, the other side of it was i had actually tested a few athletes just 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 out of interest or just because they wanted a test um and we actually found they had asthma and didn't realize it and so we, the kind of the question was well are we missing athletes that might have asthma and also our athletes who are using inhalers and haven't had a test, do, I, do, do they all need the medication? So we started to kind of like make it more of a, 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 a you know, make it more of a need to actually do respiratory tests on athletes to actually make sure the athletes who need the inhalers are getting the inhalers and, and using the right ones, but also making sure the athletes who maybe have a breathing problem and have been misdiagnosed with asthma are actually getting the right support. Because if it's not asthma that's causing the problem, the inhaler is not going to do anything and there's actually better ways to treat those people and so we started that kind of that sort of that sort of started as a sort of an offshoot of the, the work we did around the 2004 olympic games mm, yeah that's really interesting then so so in terms of like athletes having a more prevalence to, to having asthma what is has there been research done on why that is the case it, it it's basically down to exposure of to asthma triggers so you think about people who live in polluted environments, the prevalence of asthma in those polluted environments is greater than it is in less polluted environments because the, the exposure to asthmatic triggers is greater. And it's the same thing with athletes. And what a, a lot what we tend to see is the, the sports that take place in, well, the sports that require the athlete to maintain a high level of ventilation have a higher prevalence. The sports that take place in cold environments have a higher prevalence. If you put high ventilation and cold environment together, you get a higher prevalence. You put high ventilation together with polluted environment, you get a higher prevalence. So basically, if you're in a sport that has a, that basically needs you to breathe a lot and takes place in a, in a polluted environment or a cold environment, you're basically giving your, your lungs are basically have to respond to that air more or basically have to deal with that air more. So basically your lungs uh, almost get hypersensitive to the environment. And so they're more likely to kind of trigger off an inflammatory response, which will then trigger off a, a, a muscle kind of constriction around the airway. And basically over time, you, so, sometimes we might actually see that athletes develop the asthma over time um, from exposure to the sport. Um, so we can't, sometimes we argue that actually certain sports might be sort of exercise induced asthma might be an occupational kind of risk to, to, to that athlete. But what we know, what what we know is when we take away the trigger, so when an athlete stops doing the sport or stops training in that polluted environment, their severity of the asthma either lowers or it or, or the asthma goes away. So in a similar way to, for example, if you've got asthma and you're allergic to the cat, get rid of the cat, the asthma goes away. So in certain sports we can manipulate the environment or we can manipulate training times. But a lot of elite athletes, you can't, you know, they've got. A, got to go and compete in a certain arena they got to go and compete in that arena so we can't change the environment so much with them we can't change what their trigger is so then it's kind of a case of well if we can't change that then we need to make sure we try and protect the athlete's air lung function the best we can by getting them on the the right inhalers that mean that mean they use as little inhaler as possible but protect their lung their, their lung health and so by the time they finish the sport their lungs haven't been sort of uh, affected too much and so we're trying to pr sort of promote this kind of, you know, really positive outlook. It's not a problem if someone has, has asthma. We just need to know that they've got asthma to then put them on the right and to get them on the right inhalers, and they'll, 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 they'll basically they'll, they'll be able to play and compete as if they haven't got asthma. Um, and what we I've also done loads of research on on the inhalers because a lot of people think well, if you take a blue inhaler and you haven't got asthma, 
that's going to make you a better athlete, isn't it? And you go, and it's not, that's not the case. So if you take sort of two puffs of a blue inhaler, you, it, basically the way that, 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 that drug works is it's supposed to dilate your, uh, well, it dilates your, your airway. But if you haven't got asthma, your airway is already fully dilated. So you can't kind of super dilate it. So it won't, it won't do anything to a non-asthmatic. Um, so basically, you know, what, it's trying to get that sort of positive positiveness about if an, an individual has asthma, using an inhaler is, is going to be helpful for them because it's going to protect their lung health. And if they haven't got asthma and they're using an inhaler, it's not going to do anything for them. That's pretty much that's pretty much it. But it's trying to get that kind of positive spin and um, on it um, because we find, you know, you've seen reports in the press where, um, you know, so-and-so is using an asthma inhaler, so they're cheating. And you're like, that's just such a negative way of looking at it because it's not, that's not the case. Plus, you know, you've got 100,000 people with asthma t taking part in sport. And if that, you know, if, if that makes them not want to take their inhaler when they're just about to go and play a football match. And then they have an asthma attack when they're playing because they didn't want to be seen as a cheat when that is not a nowhere near the case. Then that's just not the, not the kind of, you know, not, it's not the right message we want to put out there sort of thing. So we're trying to do a lot of education with athletes and with, with sport, with sport and organi organizations to make sure it's a positive kind of kind of vibe around around kind of people with asthma rather than look at the, look at the, look at them and going oh they they're using their inhaler again they're probably trying to cheat and that's not the case. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So my mum's got asthma, and you know she's relatively later on in life that she's been using it. Um, but yeah, no, I wasn't aware of like some of the like you can see why the stigmas may stick and could be really potentially dangerous to people who don't don't use it for those reasons. So. Uh, after EIS, then you said you moved on um, about a year after being at, was it at Bisham? Yeah, so Bish at Bisham, and <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> I got fed up of basically being the asthma guy. <laughs> so I was like, I've just, I've done this test over and over and over again. I was like, Phew, I'm just, and then, um, so I actually took a, well, I took a little bit of a career break from being the asthma guy at the EIS, because I could have, I could have probably stayed there for, for quite a while and just kept doing that. But I just got a little bit. I just, there's got to be something more out there. Finish your PhD. You sort of lived lived that world for just only that world for so long, and so an opportunity came up to be a, what's called an acquisitions editor at a publisher called Human Kinetics. So, and basically the job was to come up with ideas for sports science textbooks and sports science. So I actually went and worked for Human Kinetics for two and a half years, um, and so that, and that was that was great because. Um, Part of it was we 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 really relocated to America for three months. To lived in America for three months. If anyone does sports science, it's kind of human kinetic champagne in Illinois. That's where that's where I lived <laughs> for for, um, for three months, and then came back and we lived in lived in uh, Batley, just on the outskirts of Leeds, um, up there, and that's where the, the office was near near there. So we went so yeah worked there for three years, coming up with different ideas for sports science books. But what I was able to do in human kinetics were really good was that they allowed me to work four days a week doing that. And one day a week, I kept my hand in doing the asthma testing. And I actually, I say, um, Leeds, Leeds Beckett University were, um, uh, allowed me to use their lab. So I was running a respiratory clinic out of Leeds, out of Leeds Beckett University what, on, on a Monday, testing the elite athletes in and around, um, in and around Yorkshire um for, for breathing problems one day a week and doing the the uh the acquisitions editor job uh the other four days of a week and that was quite nice i quite enjoyed that because it meant i could still do what i was good what i'd learned and was good at and still making a difference there but i was learning some new skills doing the doing the acquisitions editor um sort of role um which was great i really enjoyed the, the book editing stuff um after, just after three years, I ran out of ideas for new, for new books. It was, it was, uh, was, was the problem. You kind of, you know, every, every year they give you targets, right? You need new books, need new books, need new books. And it was good, getting to the point where they're saying, like, this year we, we want you to get like 25 new titles. I'm like, I've come, I don't know, I've, I've gone through all of these sort of, you know, got gone through that, 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 that. And now you want 25 new ones. It's like, blooming heck. And so you're just thinking at a point, I can't, I can't keep, can't keep, you know kind of creating new stuff that's actually going to sell that's actually going to sell and be any good so um so I, so i did that for three years and then um the my boss at the institute so greg he'd, he'd moved to liverpool john moore's and he contacted me um sort of middle of sort of the start of 20, 2009 and sort of said it was if i was interested did i want to apply for a do we want to apply for a, a wada grant so world anti-doping association they run research uh oh, oh have a research competition to bid for money uh, to run research projects that are relevant to the anti-doping. 
And so um, basically me and him put a, me and Greg put together a, a research grant that was looking at the impact of blue inhalers on performance. So the so basically look at trying to test whether salbutamol inhalers improve performance if athletes take the maximum amount, amount they're allowed to take in a day. And we got that, that funding was announced in October 2009. And that sort of paid for me to, to go and work as a, pro, a prof doc at Liverpool John Moores from the start of 2010. Um, and then I was sort of back in the world, then I was sort of in an academic environment then, which is different to a, an applied vi environment. But I was able to set up the respiratory clinic in Liverpool. I was still doing the one in Leeds and I was still doing this research um, with, 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 with the wider stuff. So I spent about two and a half years. Liverpool John Moores um doing doing the research um in, into into asthma medication um and and testing all the various athletes in up in the northwest and then and, and in Yorkshire for, for breathing problems uh but the any, any problem with that sort of work is it was all kind of fixed fixed term stuff so you're kind of like every year we were looking for more funding and more funding and more funding and um and so it came came to a point where you start going well actually I probably need a bit more of a stable job and the uh, opportunity came up to work as a lecturer down in Kent um, so I again applied for that and um, decided to to make the move down down to Kent. So it's, yeah, sort of jumping around and then I've been down in Kent now since I started in Kent in 2012. And now what we're 20, 20, 24, so 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> it flies by sort of thing. No, it does fly by. So you go back to that publishing role. And so how do you come up with a book idea? Well, you've got, so you, you, you it might be i come up with the idea of the book so i go actually you know we need you know we haven't for example i came uh, i started to develop and I, um I'm trying to think some of the books i came up with now um so we did we did we we did a book on tapering for example so tapering for sport and it was um that we, um, for that that particular book the uh, the author emailed me with a pitch said and it was an ego mujica who's, who's a big name in sort of the world of research of tapering he emailed me with a pitch about two two page two page pitch of a book idea and then basically I, I would read it and go, that's a good idea or that's not a good idea. And if it's a good idea, I might go back to the author and go, well, actually, if we could tweak it, if we could do this, this and this and this, that might actually work. Um, so I helped the author kind of reorganise the table of contents, organise what, what they're going to, what sort of special bits are going to be in the book. And then and then I kind of work with the, the team at Human Kinetics to actually kind of, well, what's the market for this? So you kind of go, who's going to buy it? And then you have to kind of make estimates going, well, you know, X number of sales there, X number of sales there. Someone like Human Kinetics has got a history of selling books in sports in the sports science market. So they have a feel for this type of book will sell X amount of um sort of sales in that market, X amount of sales in that market. So you put all your costs in, you work out how much it's going to cost to publish the book in terms of um pages, how many, how many, how much colour you're going to use, and all this sort of stuff. And then basically it, it churns out how profitable that book might be. Um, and if you're getting the, you know, sort of a publisher's probably looking for a book. And again, it depends on the type of book. So if you're going to sell millions of copies, they're probably going to, they're probably going to be happy with a, a bit of a smaller, smaller profit margin. In a publishing company that's quite small, they're probably looking for a bigger profit margin. So they're probably looking for a profit margin of over at least 40 to 60 percent, probably a little bit higher on, on some books. So if they can get a profit margin on that, then it, then they go. Actually, we can publish this if he, if it's coming out sort of we're barely going to make any money on this what's the point they'll you know they, they won't go so you have to try and figure out how you're going to publish the book if you're really passionate about it how are you going to publish the book to make it sort of work on work on the um work on the spreadsheet if you like um so that and then you go to a you go to what we had was then a, a what's called an acquisitions meeting i would then pitch the book to a team that would include um editors the C, the ceo or the head of division of where the book was going it would include um uh, what else would it include marketing team they're quite important because they go if they don't get it they don't they don't get it they ain't gonna publish it because they got to market it um, and so basically you'd sort of pitch the book everyone would have a chat about the numbers that you put in there and then you'd have a and you'd have a debate and then basically they say yeah we want to publish it and then you're going back to the author then at this point saying yeah we'd love to publish it and then you try then you agree in terms with the author about contracts 10 percent 12 percent 15 percent kind of royalties you know what 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 do they like and it would depend on the book. If it was a textbook, um, we, there was a different kind of policy about how we do all royalties. Whereas if it was a trade book, more of a sort of a one for to sell in a supermarket, then it would be a different, different sort of level of royalty sort of thing. So, yeah, it's it a totally different set of skills. 
but it's again it's sort of like make you a bit business savvy make made you a bit more understanding the profit margins and things like that you know when you're trying to book especially when you university now you're trying to pitch new ideas you can really you know those sort of skills i've got apart from working in the business world it's sort of you start to you know think about it's not just about doing something because it's good it's got to be doing something and making sure that you're not going to you know make the university go bankrupt or anything like that so yeah um, no, that's really interesting. It is. I mean, I think that all that commercial aspect of things is that we literally everyone is doing some sort of sales, aren't they? Whatever, whatever they're doing. So being able to to translate and communicate with people. So what was it like as well working for an American company? Both like when you were on site there, but like I'm sure because they're like the king of sales, aren't they? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's, it's totally it's really weird, you know. Just just sort of certain things, you know. That, that first of all, they start way earlier than we do. You know, they're they're on their emails for some of them from four or five o'clock in the morning, and they just they're just up early. Um, and they go to you know they're in bed by nine o'clock, but they're up early. They're like they're like an early start. Um, but no, it's great. I mean, because it was a sports science publisher, it was actually quite a good. Again, it's quite a good good company. And again, you talked about kind of the start. We talked about kind of people that kind of have a kind of growth mindset. They you know it's actually the actual company itself was started by a sports psychologist. Um, so it, ha- it, ha- it had sports psychology and, and sports science in its essence and said all the philosophy was about kind of coaching philosophy and growth mentality and that sort of thing. So Rainer Martin started the company um, in, in Illinois because he couldn't find a publisher to publish some proceedings from a conference. And so he set it up in his garage, and published them and then published a bit more and published a bit more. And suddenly he was he was publishing books. So they had this kind of mindset that they were a sports science company rather than a, pu- a book publisher, really. So you're going in there and, you know, they had, you know, things like that on site canteen there, but they, but, you know, they, they, they had fitness classes going on throughout the day, you know, your fitness class in the morning they, and they were, these were all free for staff to, to use and stuff like that. So it's brilliant. So I got quite fit whilst I was, <laughs> whilst I was out there, didn't do so much work, but no, but it, but it was great. Um, so yeah, no, but it was quite interesting working for an American company, but then going back to the UK and being kind of, so I was sort of in charge of uh, acquiring books for the European market. And sometimes we were having a bit sort of a bit of a culture issues around kind of well what what works in Europe maybe doesn't work in America and vice versa. They were kind of going, why isn't this book that sells loads in America selling in Europe? And you're kind of going, it's basically you know we're saying tomatoes and tomatoes here, but it's, but that's important because they were talking about kinesiology. We don't use that word kinesiology in in the UK. And basically, what they mean is sports science. And so they would have a book called Sports Kinesiology. And then we go and we go that that title's just not going to sell over here. Um, and so we just just those sort of, you know, it's that you know we you think that we all talk the same language, but <laughs> but we don't. They don't even spell properly. So um, <laughs> yeah. And so I mean that is that is really interesting. It's uh, I think any sort of link into those areas, but so it's like books is a it's a massive industry now. Um, so like when you came back here then and you've worked with various different teams, you mentioned about being starstruck when you were at Liverpool. Like what, what are the other particularly memorable things that you've had in your career that you can really go back to? Uh, well, I mean, say so Liverpool, I mean, I said going into some of the big teams. So we've gone to screen, we've gone to screen Liverpool, we've gone to screen Arsenal. Um, we've gone into, uh, done, done some work with, I mean, that, the hardest bit was going to Man United and being professional. <laughs> so I said, but I have that, did it, managed it, went into Everton. Did did did, did um, some of the players at Everton. So I've gone through quite a few of the elite, elite football teams. Um, uh, done quite a few of the elite uh, uh, rugby teams. So did Leicester Tigers, London Irish, uh, England Sevens. Did quite a lot um, when um, when we first started doing stuff. Um, and I think some of the most some of the, some of the bits you kind of you know, you actually you, you know you help players get better. So you, you, some of the work we did was you know we kind of help players understand why they might be getting breathless, help them out. And it helps kick them on. And so we did. Um, I remember doing some stuff with some of the rugby players and, and you know, they were kind of good, good club level players. And then once we kind of worked with them and supported them, they were, you know, them, them playing for England and things. And you kind of like, that, you know, that's brilliant. Had had a few examples with with cycling where some of the uh, where worked with some junior cyclists um, who were really struggling with their breathing. Um, and again, this is sort of more of this unexplained breathlessness when we worked on breathing pattern and helped them improve their breathing pattern. And then they could do all their training. And then I kind of you kind of forget about them. And then about four years later, you see them at the Olympic Games. You go, oh, that was good. That was, you know, that's quite because at that point they were maybe they maybe weren't going to get go in, into the senior squad because they couldn't do all the training. 
and the same 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 thing happened with some of the Rowan the Rowan team as well. So there are quite a few there. I think probably you know or, or, apart from doing the Liverpool lot, probably the, the, the biggest experience I had recently was I um, we went and screened the whole of the England football team before the 2018 World Cup, and that was that was a great experience. That was because when you kind of you know you kind of go in St George's Park, and then you kind of go for all the security, and then once you're in once you're inside the bubble. It's you know it's basically you know it's a, it's the atmosphere is fantastic and you know everyone is kind of you know everyone's doing a professional job but you know there's that respect and the way they set it up was you know there's not very sometimes you go to football clubs and it's like that's the manager's table that's the first team's table that's the reserve team table over there England it was pretty much once you're in once you're in the bubble everyone's an equal and everyone's you know and you know so I remember t- I, t- I took one of my master students with me um, at the time to help me do the testing. And we went in on the second day um, and we had to sort of set up before they had their breakfast. Um, and we sort of walked through the breakfast area and Gareth Southgate was in the area and he kind of came straight over to me, me and the student and sort of shook our hands and said hello. We're now getting on. We explained to him we we're just going to set up um, and he said, oh, make sure you come back to get some breakfast. So we came back in, obviously, <laughs> to get to get some free food. Um, and I sort of sat, I, I sort of left my, we sort of sat down at a table, the whole, it was pretty empty, sat down at a table. I, I so I went to off to get myself a cup of tea. By the time I come back, Gareth Southgate had plumped himself down next to my 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 master student, and was just basically chewing the fat with us for half an hour over breakfast. Well, you know, he's having his eggs Benedict, and we're you know we're just you know explaining what we're doing. And he was just probing, and he, he had some of the other coaching staff, some of the players sort of came came and sat down, and it was just you know that's the sort that was a, such a good experience to sort of, sort of go. And then you kind of look at some of the some of the things that they had embedded you can kind of explain why they had such a good world cup that year and why they did so well at the euros um and then have done so well um at the last at the, the last tournament so you can sort of see kind of how they've built that um, you know built a very very comfortable environment for not just the players to perform well but also the the practitioners to kind of be comfortable performing well as well and i think that that was that was something that you know i was, I was probably one of the most impressive kind of atmospheres that i've been in was that kind of england that england setup yeah, no, that's great. It's nice. It's nice to hear, isn't it? That it's like you actually, you know, top top names going into a big tournament, but really down to earth as well. Yeah. And then, so in terms of like the breathing, that's on the elite sport end. But how has COVID impacted the work that you're doing? Yeah. So, so even before COVID, we were, we were kind of working with people that were maybe kind of like had bad chest infections. But so some of the work, well, some of the more re- some of the research that's kind of come out of the work we did we did with elite athletes was that we found a lot of elite athletes would develop this condition that we call breathing pattern disorder so it's called bpd um and so some of the research that we've done at the university of kent was to understand what breathing pattern disorder is and you know because if you think about well what what's a good breath ask someone what a good breath is and they go hmm, i was born started breathing and just kept doing it but the way I, I sort of see breathing now is breathing is a little bit breathing pattern in terms of the way we move our rib cage is a little bit like the way we walk. You know, we kind of everyone's got a slightly different walking style, slightly different walking gait. Um, and what sometimes happens is if if that if you get challenged, so say, for example, you sprain your ankle, you change your walking gait a little bit. And then sometimes when some people, when they when their ankle isn't sprained, they they never stop walking as if they got a sprained ankle so they kind of hold on to the gait that they 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 kind of adopted from from the um from the injury now what happens when you get something like covid or something like a chest infection sometimes people change the way they breathe because of the because of the chest infection because of the covid and so what we're seeing kind of post covid some of the reason why people are experiencing long covid is part of that is potentially down to the fact they've actually changed their breathing that breathing pattern after covid and haven't necessarily let go of it so they kind of hold their hold their tension up here sort of breathe a bit higher up so when they start to do things like you know walk upstairs and things like that, they start to get breathless quicker um and so they get then go to the doctor saying I'm, I'm breathless i'm getting early onset fatigue and you know getting tired so i mean that doesn't explain that, that doesn't necessarily explain every reason why people get breathless but what we started to do with kind of people who are long COVID actually offer kind of breathing clinics where get groups of people with long COVID and just teach them what good breathing pattern is and what good breathing technique is and you know we give them about four four kind of sessions and the the, the feedback we're getting is really really positive because I think part of it is you know just having a bit of education around what a good breath is what can I do if I start to feel a bit breathless where should I start breathing from what you know 
do I do I put my hands on my head? Do I do I put my hands on my knees? We you know everyone tells me lots of different things. Do I breathe from my nose? Do I breathe from my mouth? What is it? Um, so we're just able to kind of debunk some of those myths. Just go go for that. But pretty much the way we teach people along COVID how to breathe properly is exactly the same way we teach the athletes how to breathe. Because essentially where where we breathe from is the same sort of area, sort of lower lower rib cage where the, where the breath starts from. And if you start to increase your activity, that that place doesn't change. It just means you might do it a bit more forcefully. But the emphasis of a good breath is the same for an elite athlete as it is for uh, you know someone who's seventy five. But it's just about you know trying to educate that and and understand why a person might be developing breathlessness um, and go from there really. But it's it's been really you know it's been so, so some of the best things I've done recently. Just people have been telling me things. Oh you know I can. I can now kind of walk around the house without spilling my cups of tea everywhere because I'm not breathless and that sort of stuff. And and that's, you know, they're, they're, they're made up because they can live a bit more of a normal li- life than, than what they could do uh, beforehand. So, you know, that it, that's been as good as helping someone, you know, get, get uh, you know, into the Olympic team or go and get, you know, go and win an Olympic medal or something. So, um, so yeah, so it's been, it's been quite valuable, really. Mm, yeah, it's really interesting. And then, so what are your thoughts on like? There's a lot of apps out there now. A lot of focus on breath work, meditation. What are your thoughts on those? Oof. Um, I mean, I think they're all good. I, mean, I think that sort of stuff is is fine if used in the right kind of way. Um, so, uh, what those sort of, sort of apps do, sort of like breathe in for two, out for two, or or you know, breath holding, and they're all focused on really kind of relaxation and and things which. In, in in one area is fine, but what what I sort of more specialise in is what do we how do we breathe when we start to be bringing some activity? So when we start to when we start to move, when we start to exercise, we still you know we're going to have to start to breathe a bit deeper. We're going to start to breathe a little bit faster. How do we do that in an efficient, optimal way? So I think those all, all those kind of breathing apps are okay to to support breathing and relaxation at rest, but they may not be the best to actually. Kind of help when you sort of improve your sporting or your or breathing when you're being a bit more physically active yeah yeah no that makes sense makes sense no no i appreciate your time today so like what, what would your advice be for people trying to get into maybe not as specific as, as what you're doing but getting into the sports science research elite sport area um well f- f- first of all i think i think probably what i always say is that I've, what i've done probably over over, over my career, career is i've always done things that i want you know basically followed my passion if you like so follow follow something that i'm passionate because i think if you start doing something that you don't really love if you like you start doing things and you know you can fall out of love with it pretty quickly so don't do something just because you think that's the right thing to do do it do it because do it because you actually really want to do it so if you've got a passion for something you're more, more likely to see it through so make sure if you are thinking about, you know, a career in sport, sports science or sport, make sure you, you pick the area that you're most passionate about because you're more likely to sell it and, you know, and 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 go that extra mile, you know, putting those putting those putting that time in the evenings to, to do that sort of work. Um be proactive. Don't be afraid of asking people questions or asking for opportunities. Because the worst thing someone's gonna say is, sorry, we haven't got anything at the minute. But you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. And you know, and, and like I say, bit don't be scared of doing something that you have that you haven't done before for example i talked about you know i could i could have kind of applied for that phd with the, with the british, british olympic association and gone don't know much about lung function you know but actually you know be, back yourself a little bit and go you know what i don't know much about it now but i can learn it and i think as long as you back yourself then then you know you're probably gonna you know you're probably gonna make it it's just it's just having having the time because I, I i do have some 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 students we work with i offer them an opportunity and it's a great opportunity. They go, I've not done that before. And it's like, well, you, you, you just got you just got to jump in, and uh, you know, and, and you'll and you'll learn it. But it's um, yeah, just try try not to worry too much about what you haven't done. You go actually, I'll, you know, what I don't know, I'll learn, and I'll try and learn it pretty quick. Yeah, no, no, I think it's good advice. Definitely good advice. I think it's like it's up to the people who are giving out whatever they're giving out to make that decision. All you can do is like just put yourself in the in the. Uh, in the hat for it so to speak but no john like really enjoyed that i've learned a lot there's been some very interesting points around uh it was well in terms of just breath like the, the wider stuff i think is really interesting as well yeah that's your last point on that then so in terms of like sport there's a lot of thing around drug testing now and i know yours is in a specific element of it but what are your thoughts when say boxers are one of the when i'm a big boxing fan when you see boxers come back with positive drug tests <laughs> just to finish on that yeah well i mean i, I think so 
what I mean, tr I try and be as positive as I can about it, but sometimes the drug the drug developers, if you like, or the people that are designing drugs, they are sometimes one step ahead of the anti-doping authorities because you kind of need to have the the substance before you can find the find the test to test for it, if you, if you like. Remember the, the I've forgotten the name, the Balco scandal in America when it basically they only found out that people were using this this um the drugs because the the coach kind of gave gave um the testers the, the the formula for what they should be looking for um so in some respects there are there are some some you know some high-tech cheats out there but i think on the on the whole a lot of the those kind of things that are coming up with boxing are potentially from just not necessarily paying close attention to kind of what the rules are and sometimes they might take a, a supplement because you know it's got the protein in or something like that and and they don't read the finer the finer points of what what's in that supplement and things so education is key for that key for that and it's it's it's, it's a i think sometimes that you know basically they've got like a black and white policy if it's in the athlete it's the athlete's pro it's the athlete's fault but there's lots of people around the athlete you know if you're if you're an athlete and you've got a doctor saying well you've got allergies i'm going to get you this medication that's the best thing for your best thing for your allergies if you're the athlete you're relying on that doctor to basically be the the expert and tell you and you're you're kind of going because you don't you know you've got this long you've got this drug that's real long word and you're going well if you as long as you say it's all right for me to take doc i'll, I'll trust you i think sometimes you know athletes do put themselves in the trust of the coach the medical team physios and, and practitioners like me and sometimes um you know i don't know sometimes i think the 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 balance between when it's our when it, where's it where's it our case as practitioners to be interested in the health of the athlete but there's also a big carry if that athlete performs really well suddenly I'm the practitioner I'm the I'm the medic that's worked with that doctor that worked with that athlete so therefore I'm going to get propelled and I'm going to get I'm going to basically be you know a bit of a star if you like so you know, there is that temptation from not just the athlete but from the team around that to actually go well actually if we can manipulate the rules a little bit we might be able to 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 to, to help it and it it's a real you know you hate to think like that but ultimately you sort of say actually there's a temptation there so um maybe 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 some of them have done that but i think a lot of the time a lot of the athletes um you know it's i'm probably being being nice to them but saying actually sometimes i think they might take something like it's more more like a supplement rather than actually what they've eaten and it might be more of a supplement issue that's a little little product in the supplement that they haven't necessarily realised is, is a banned sub substance, and that's what's kind of ticking them over. So there's all sorts of reasons why sort of these doping violations t t take place, and and also the, the 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 rules change year on year, so the athletes have got to stay up with it. It's quite a big quite a big bit of work, and if you know boxers generally tend to work in isolation, they tend to work in their little little bubbles. They're not like a football club that's got a big medic medical team, so. Um, but ultimately, they've got to live by the same rules as all these big sports do. So it's not it's not easy. Um, but I say with 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 the asthma side of things, from my experience, um, it, it, as long as the athletes using what should be prescribed as, as asthma therapy, they they you know basically they're just protecting their lung health, and there is no performance enha enhancement from from doing that. So um, and then obviously like different drugs do different things. So um, you're sort of looking at the drug that's being used as well when you kind of go up. You know, have have you got have you got that problem, or have you you know? Because I think there's a big big issue with a a drug that dealt that with sort of heart failure that a lot of tennis players were using um a, like a while ago, <laughs> and then suddenly it got banned. And like, oh, I, I don't have that problem anymore, so I'll stop using it, sort of thing. And you're like, mm. <laughs> you know, maybe they were just abusing the rules and going, oh, well, that that drug might help me do that sort of thing, and it's allowed to be taken, so I'll do that. And uh, and now I can't take it, so I won't. Uh, no. That problem that, that problem doesn't exist anymore, sort of thing. So yeah, it does sound a really like minefield for trying to keep on top of it. But fortunately, I don't have to worry about it. It's just a shame when these fights get called off. But I yeah. guess they've got to they've got to have the rules for it. But no, John, look, thank you for staying on. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'll uh, look forward to catching up soon. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, John.